Hello everybody, welcome to the new week. Today's lecture is lecture one, part two of drawing as communication um, through the lens of design drawing. Um, <clears throat> today's lecture is called design drawings, floor plans to isometric and everything in between. So just to recap the part one, um, which was called Idea Generation, Diagramming, and Freehand Design Drawings. We discussed the types of design communication, um, which are listed graphically at the bottom of this slide, um, one through five. And each one of those is an important form of design communication at different stages throughout the design process. And these are all separate courses that you will encounter at Western. Um, and then we also talked about idea generation. So if you look um, at some of these images, you'll start to see um, different drawing and diagramming um, like ways of thinking through projects and um, generating ideas. Some of those being um, bubble diagrams and block diagrams. So just like we did for our assignment one workspace, you designed two bubble diagrams that were just scenarios playing with different program, program elements um, versus being a reflection of the actual floor plan. So you could continue making those bubble diagrams and explore a wide variety of different spatial arrangements. And in doing that, um, an idea might generate. Um, and then we also briefly discussed sketching and rendering, um, freehand drawings, as you see in the upper right hand corner, that is a freehand little office kind of drawing. You can see that the chair, um, and the desk, those, I, I can tell it's a chair too, because the chair has a little bit of hatching, um, which indicates that it is a symbol as opposed to a notation um, or an annotation or a different type of symbol. And then we also briefly discussed scale figures. The One of the last pages on that presentation showed different styles of scale figures. And those weren't the extent of all the styles out there. And over this um, course, and really throughout your studies at Western and beyond, you will develop your own style of scale figure that works um, most appropriately with your style of rendering. Today we're moving on to the next um, phase of talking about drawing as communication. We're, we're talking specifically about design drawings. Um, so you may have noticed that in the agenda, we call this schematic design drawings. So we're going to talk about what does schematic mean and why can they be called just design drawings? Um, and then we're, we're going to go through each type of drawing or common design drawing, um, from site plan, floor plans, elevations, sections, details, specialty, perspectives, axonometric, and isometric. After this, um, we will be moving into part three um, in future lectures where we will specifically talk about the construction documents and the three important elements that go into construction documents, which are the specifications, the working drawings or construction drawings, and the contract. So it's important to differentiate um, the term construction documents with the term construction drawings. And we will get into that um, much more deeply in the future lecture. So back to our question, what is schematic? What does schematic mean and why can't we just call our drawings design drawings? What you see here on this chart is a plan of work. Um, from the Royal Institute of British Architects, also known as REBA. So REBA is 
a organization very similar to what we have in the United States, which is called the American Institute of Architects, AIA. So the AIA and REBA both have their own set of standards, ethical codes, moral codes, um, professional documentation styles, um, the list goes on. And what we see here is REBA's uh, illustrated and explained design process. So we have strategic definition, preparing and briefing, concept design, spatial coordination, technical design, manufacturing and construction, handover, and uses. If we go back and look at the list of drawings, you know, that in the um, agenda that we will be talking about today, you will be able to take each one of those drawings and place them in the appropriate um, phase of the design process, whether they're concept drawings, um, they're idea generation drawings, or they're um, a more technical elevation. Um, so the word schematic is actually not used in this um, plan of work for the different drawing phases and drawing types. So I encourage you to look at this page in more detail. Again, across the top, it goes through the different phases of design and along the left hand column, it has the different criteria that they are evaluating in each phase. Um, so the stage outcome, the goals essentially, the core tasks, okay, what do you do during this phase, um, different types of processes, um, procurements, and inf information exchanges. That is just a, you know, a little bit more um, technical and project specific. The most important for us right now will be the outcomes and the core tasks um, in terms of differentiating the different phases and comparing this chart in um, design process to that of the AIAs. Here we have a chart that communicates the AIAs design process. So um, there's four overall stages. There's research, design and documentation, pricing and construction. And within each one of those four overarching categories are different phases of design. So in research, we have pre-design. Um, and so if you look down, it's the information gathering phase and what's involved, background research about site and location, survey of existing conditions, um, confirm project feasibility and programming. So we've already done um, or explored a little bit of what that might entail. You have measured your workspace, which is a way of documenting existing conditions. Um, and then you've also looked into programming. So you've done a little bit of this pre-design research. The next design phase um, is schematic design. And that's really what we're going to focus on today. But I wanted to use these charts to communicate that even though we call, or it's popular that we call a schematic design drawing or schematics or schematic design, the word schematic in relationship to design and design drawings is a very specific um, phrase related to the AIA. So around other parts of the world, the schematic design phase might be called something else. Um, and that is okay. There, you know, we, your professional career might not be in the United States. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you understand design processes universally. And um, using the phrase design drawings um, is something that could apply to all different um, design processes. And so within the schematic design, um, according to the AIA, this is when you will test your ideas and sketches or test ideas and concepts through sketches um, and then client feedback. So you'll show them your concept. They'll give you feedback. 
Um, they'll say, yes, I love your ideas. Keep moving forward. Um, and then you can start to put together preliminary floor plans, which happens from the further development of your bubble diagrams. In the other phases, design development and construction documents, um, those two we will talk about um, in the next lecture. Design development, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit today, but it will be a transition into construction documents for us. Um, building permit, bidding and negotiation, and construction administration is not um, really a part of what we will be getting into in this class when it comes to design communication. Those are really important parts of the design process, um, but they're a little bit more um, political, so to speak, and um, they also often are very specialized per discipline. So you will be getting into discussions about that in classes such as professional practice. So let's recap. If we talked about pre-design already in assignment one, what exactly did that mean for us? So here's a more elaborated definition of pre-design. So it is an information gathering phase. And it's the foundation to all of the other design phases. It's where you learn everything about the clients, um, including their personality, their lifestyle, their needs, um, and you also determine how much space you need. Um, you organize and create a program um, which describes all the rooms and spaces for the project, their sizes and specific qualities or unique features you are looking for. So every program, depending on the project, will be a little bit different. It will include the list of spaces and their sizes, but these specific qualities or unique features may change from project to project, depending on what it is and who your clients are. So for instance, you're, you might be doing a artist studio as one of your projects, in which case um, access to natural daylight is critical for artists to accurately see color that they're working with, um, to accurately see shadows, um, but it's also a super sustainable um, design uh, quality because you can eliminate um, a lot of artificial light. But you might have another project where, like say it's a museum now, and natural daylight is not something that you like. Natural daylight can deteriorate artifacts and cause fading um, and other types of wear and tear to important interior elements. So with a museum, you want to minimize um, not so to, not really the natural daylight, but the direct natural daylight hitting the artifacts and the items on display. Uh, so you, would, you might create a list of the spaces that involve the different types of exhibition areas or the galleries and list the best type of lighting to showcase them and to protect them, which is very different from the artist studio. So that, that's just an example of how spaces can be relatively similar, but also extremely different. So during pre-design, you also observe and document the existing conditions. Um, for us, in assignment one, that was the field measurements. You may be getting a project uh, where you need to visit an existing site and document the dimensions of the space so that you can go back uh, to your desk and draft, accurately draft the space so then you can design on top of it. You'll also do background research to better understand how the site relates to the surrounding areas, the climate, people, and regulations. So we did this through various discussions in class in the feedback um, when I would ask you things such as what direction does your workspace face and what does that mean for the light coming into the space or the view that you're looking at um, 
or perhaps even the relationship of the entry to the different zones in your space. So schematic design, which is what we will be talking about today. In this phase, you translate the program into building design. So you do this by exploring design concepts, um, getting a general idea of the look and feel. So floor plans and the shape of the project will begin to take form. You will present ideas to the client using images of other projects that you've studied for case study purposes. You may do a variety of hand sketches or three-dimensional digital models to help visualize the size, shape, and relationship of space to each other. This phase is when design is most fluid. So it's the easiest to change design and to come up with new design or make design innovations along the way. Once you move on to design development, which is where you take the decided upon design or the approved design and further develop it into detail. During this phase, if you have a major design change or even a minor design change, it can have rippling impacts on the whole project and put you back into the beginning of schematic design again. So schematic design is when you really want to make sure that you are honing in, making sure you're getting your concept, making sure you're satisfying the program and all of the special qualities that your clients need from the project. But what are design drawings and what do they look like? This is a really awesome short video that shows a process of an architect that I think that you will recognize from some of the bubble diagrams and thoughts that you've already had when drawing your own space. So we'll play this. I'm an architect who loves to draw. My name is Barry Burkus. I'm in my studio in Santa Barbara, and we're going to look at a house that we designed and tell you how and why we designed the house the way it is. Clients came to us and they said, we want to build on the beach. We want to build in a place that has great ocean views. We want to build a house that allows us to bring our extended family home, but we want to have a place that's private for them also. So we looked at putting the living kitchen across the back to enjoy the view, the library to enjoy the view, a stairway that went upstairs so the master bedroom sat over the top of the kitchen area and a guest room over the living room and a bridge that connected that and the guest over here and actually another bridge that connected the guest to their own bedroom suites which were over a motor court in the front. So as you start to, this becomes a house. It is a drawing that as you start to sketch, you, you draw a diagram and the diagram becomes architecture. So what we were looking at once again was the ocean that ran along the area here. We're looking at, once again, winds that came from the west side over here, sun that came east and west. And we looked at the kitchen being on the morning side of the house. Always think about the kitchen, enjoying the east light. The sun is a wonderful thing to gain in the morning. In the afternoon, the warmth in the living room. And we looked at the house as it ran a courtyard so that if the winds came, that we would end up being able to shelter the people around a fireplace in the courtyard that we came through from Motor Court, which was the garages in front. So very simply then, this became a living room with a fireplace sitting in the floor, seating areas around the fireplace, the dining room in this area here, the kitchen that was back in this side of the house on the east side with sun coming in in the morning and the idea that the library on this edge of the house would enjoy the quiet and we could block the west sun with that. But we're watching the beach, looking at the surf, looking at a pool that sits in the yard. And it became a place that water in an infinity pool poured over into the ocean visually. And then water in the front kept the acoustics that were from the noise of the road and the, and the uh, train away from the innards of the house. Enter here look to light, look to the right, the library, the piano, look to the left, to the dining room, towards the kitchen, views up and down the coast. 
but all houses that we work on become diagrams that are bubbles, then start to become harder lines, and the forms start to come together. And it's an exercise in thinking with the hand and the mind that will go from just a little bit more detailed than this to the computer, where it really becomes an organized piece put together by the designers that are working with me on the house. So it all begins as a pattern and a diagram. The idea of where things are and how they interrelate adjacencies and the opportunities of the sun in the afternoon, the sun in the morning, the views to the water, and the idea that the bridge puts together the guest and the master looking down into the wonderful views of the house. The people that have this house are wonderful clients and it's a house that we are very, very proud of as architects. And that, I think, is the greatest reward an architect can have, is a happy client, a great building, and a place that they want to go back and visit because of the meaning of the piece that they've designed and the strength of the architecture. So that video is really great because he talks about how he translates his bubble diagrams into architecture. Um, as interior designers, we often think about our designs from the inside out. Um, when he started his process, he was thinking about the outside in. You notice that he um, established the site with the water and the road. Um, we, we could do that, but we typically, you know, work from the inside out as based upon what we're interested in doesn't mean that either one is right or wrong they do complement each other but it is important as he mentioned to know how certain rooms interact with the outside such as the kitchen and the east light there's a lot of different spaces and opportunities that they can have with the exterior site. So it does become a marriage between architecture and interior design when designing a space. But <clears throat> before he even started his bubble diagrams, he created a program. He learned about the clients and he documented existing conditions. He also did some background research. We talked about this before, but I want to uh, go over some of these again before we really get started on schematic drawings. So some of that background research might be the climate. He talked about the wind, understanding how the wind is coming through the building, um, the project location, the materials that a designer um, wants to use or needs to use or anticipates the use of, um, any concept related ideas important cultural considerations. And so by that, you might think of people um, of different religions or practices or faith or social customs. Um, different people use dining rooms differently. Um, <clears throat> different people view the entrance as a different experience. So you wanna understand those important cultural considerations. You also may wanna look into sustainability and third-party rating systems. We will talk about third-party rating systems later on in the class, but just to briefly explain it, you may have heard of something called LEED. Um, LEED is a acronym um, that is, it's a system where you can get LEED certified. Um, but you have to have a lead accredited designer and you have to meet a threshold of sustainable requirements for your design. Lead is not the only third party rating system. There are many, many more. Lead was one of the first ones in terms of sustainability, but today there are uh, more comprehensive ones, ones that focus more on psychology, different aspects of the project and we will fully go into those um, in this class and you will study those more extensively in future classes. A designer will also need to look into the codes and regulations. So for example, even though you may not be 
doing the building design, you're doing the interior design. In some instances, you are doing the building design when it comes to smaller projects, but you do need to understand codes and regulations. Um, here's a, an example from my own practice. Um, I think it was about two years ago now. Uh, my firm, Hungary Architecture, was hired to design the first recreational dispensary in Grand Rapids. And so with that comes a list of all new codes and regulations to ensure safety and quality and prevent crime, um, a lot of different things. We have codes for a lot of things. And so when a new building type uh, comes into play in a city, new codes and regulations are required. So with this building, there was the local codes and regulations, but there's also federal regulations and uh, regulations within the specific industry. So one example would be that relates to the interiors would be the um, visibility of certain areas inside. So in Grand Rapids, it's prohibited that you cannot visually see the sale or the exchange of money for goods when you are purchasing recreational marijuana. You can see other things, but when it comes to the checkout counter, essentially, it needs to be not visual through the windows from the outside. However, <laughs> through the specific industry's own regulations, it's a safety requirement to have the desk be visible to various parts of the project. So a lot of eyes on the desk, it's not isolated in a corner where nobody can see it. So now we had these two opposing uh, codes and regulations, but it's, it's a total interior aspect. And you have to really think about how, how can you can achieve both of those requirements in the design. And so that's just one example. There's always going to be examples of codes and regulations that will occur in your own practice. You also want to gather information about design elements and principles that can relate to your concept. You want to make sure that your space is applying appropriate universal design as needed. And you also want to look into project precedents and case studies. So a precedent is an example of a project similar in some kind of way to your concept or your idea that has that's existing already that you can look to to learn from. Um, and then a case study is a very similar thing, but it looks more in terms of uh, more technical aspects, such as you want to know a case study on how this type of uh, awning performs uh, in different climates. But a project precedent might be looking more at a different how can we achieve the shading elements required for the concept idea of this project. So they do look at different different things. They're, they're very similar and often those words are used interchangeably, but they do have that subtle difference. This list was not exhaustive of all of the different things that designers gather information about um, during or before diagramming. So here we have three different drawings. If I were to ask you which drawing came first, we'll say that each one, all of these drawings are of the same space. Which one came first? Yes, so this is more or less a block diagram, which is a bubble-shaped block. It's the transition between the bubble diagram in a more formalized spatial arrangement. It still shows arrows indicating important views and or circulation paths that existed in the bubble diagrams. However, it's taking those bubbles and now applying them to a more realistic 
um, spatial arrangement. What is the second drawing? Yes, so this is a block shape floor plan. We have a more formalized floor plan. Um, you can see the incorporation of line weights and architectural features. You can see key structural elements. If you look closely at this drawing specifically, you can see some of the column or the intentions where the columns are taking place. And it still shows arrows indicating important views and or circulation paths because in a way it is still in ideation phase. And of course that means this one on the left is the third, which is a fully developed floor plan, includes incorporation of line weights and materiality if the materiality is important. It has accurate wall thicknesses, dimensions, notations, labels, architectural symbols, and scale. So let me go back. Um, we are going to go through each drawing type now. And in the schematic drawing phase, it's a combination of block plan to the block floor plan, like the bubble block plan <laughs> to the block floor plan. Um, so the first drawing type you have is a site plan. A site plan is a drawing um, meant to show the relationship between the inside and the outside spaces. Site plans include landscaping design ideas, exterior spaces such as decks, pools, parking, parking lots, patios, and the basic geography of the site. So if you look on the right, the image on the right, you see those um, squiggly lines. Um, not the circles, but the more the lines. Uh, those are contours or contours show the grade of the site. So here you can see that there is a slope going down to what looks like might be a retention pond of some kind for drainage. Site plans are all created differently. They will not be designed equally. This is because building authorities will require different things. Governments require site plans in order to ensure that both the local and state building codes are adhered to when it comes to making changes and additions to specific properties. So for instance, going back to the contours and the grading and the retaining pond, many ordinances require that the site has no runoff water. All runoff water stays on the site. Runoff water is when you have um, a storm or any type of precipitation um, on the site. So when you put a structure on the site, it can cause that water to have directionality and it can spit it into other properties. It can, it can put it into the road. Um, we have gutters and downspouts to help direct where that uh, runoff will go. And we often point those downspouts to rain garden areas or vegetation where that water can be absorbed. Um, in the example of this site plan, the intention is that the water will drain down the hill into that retaining pond. So showcasing that intent um, and that plan will help satisfy the government requirement where runoff stays on the site. Another reason that site plans um, are important is because they do contribute to historical records. You can usually type in an address in your local library, um, local history library, and it, you will find any evidence of any design on the site. So you could see what the original plot looked like, the first, you know, build, maybe it was a farm and then it turned into a you know, event center and now it's a housing complex. And so you would see the site change over time in the historical records. For us, a site plan is a detailed plan that prevent, that presents a diagram of proposed improvements or additions to a particular piece of land. Now, 
do you think that the interior environment begins at the threshold of a building or before entering? This is um, a hypothetical question now, but we will be talking about this more in class. Here are some examples of site plans with important parts and things to keep in mind when drawing. Um, always keep in mind line weights. <laughs> you will see this uh, over and over and over. Line weights uh, will help you communicate any design intention. So as you see in the upper right hand corner, the actual boundary of the site is in that dark um, dashed line. But then we have a thinner dark dashed line around the perimeter or the footprint of the actual structures on the site followed by some hatching, followed by lighter lines of the landscape and site elements. And so our mind can very clearly differentiate all of those elements from one another because of the line weights. If those circles on the site, which indicate trees or a tree canopy, were of equal line weight to the building, you might consider it or confuse it as a part of the building or vice versa. And so site plans can be sketchy with notes, like in this example we were talking about, or more concentrated renderings, like in the bottom right-hand corner. And as you can see, by looking at these site plans, um, you can see a lot of the floor plan is still exposed, and that is because it is really important to understand how the interior spatial arrangement uh, relates to the outside, especially when you have exterior environments such as patios, decks, walkways, pools, any, any type of designed environment on the site, um, or natural environments as well. So you want to use a site plan to hone in on those important design items. Even if your site plan was not to show the geography of the site and evidence of meeting regulations, your site plan might be more to show the concept of your idea and how people enter the space and what they experience on their way in which might greatly impact the interior experience. So a part of this is hatching of materiality. There's a lot of different materials and textures to distinguish on a site plan, um, probably more so than interior. So that is really important when drawing it, regardless if you're using color or rendering or if it's just sketchy um, or if it's black and white and diagrammatic, like in the upper left hand corner, you can see that a lot of the arrows look like arrows from the program or the bubble diagrams that we've been looking at. And those arrows are important because um, you, so for instance, if you had a bubble with a living room and you wanted a view out to a specific outdoor area, now you can show that in, in the floor plan, but you can connect that arrow, ar arrow to the actual element on the site. The next type of design drawing is a floor plan. So floor plans are scale drawings that show the relationship between room, spaces, and physical features viewed from above. They provide a way to visualize how people will move through the space. Preliminary block and space diagrams are refined in scale and proportioned to represent the actual square footage and placement of spaces. Some floor plans illustrate overall space concepts, while others are used to express materiality and furniture arrangement. Just like site plans, a floor plan drawing is tailored to communicate the design intention of a particular project, and it is common that multiple iterations of floor plan diagrams are drawn before arriving at the design solution. So recall the video that we watched about the architect designing the house. He laid out a piece of trace paper and started drawing out bubble diagrams. And then he took another piece of trace paper and laid it on top. So he could see the first layer coming through and he drew on top of that. 
That is a layering technique that works fantastic when you are developing an idea and you want to keep the information of each space, but you want to be able to make a drawing that doesn't have that information on it when you look at it. Um, so you can lay your paper over it. And this is how you would draw iterations of a floor plan. You might, you know, it could be subtle, like how does the kitchen relate to the dining room? Or it could be large, like what happens if I put this guest bedroom on the other side of the house? So you can use uh, the different trace papers to eliminate having to redraw certain elements. So in this case, a good um, example would be to create a simple drawing of the site in general and lay that down and then lay another piece of trace paper over it to start diagramming and then another over that so that you don't have to redraw the site every single time. It shows through. Here are some examples of floor plans and things to keep in mind. Um, again, you can incorporate conceptual area, arrows from the pre-design. Um, some floor plans include color coding to define spaces and connect to the drawings or diagrams. Um, the color coding perhaps that you gave to your bubble diagrams. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, you can see how now these different spaces have the light low opacity or high opacity shading over them. It doesn't take away from the actual floor plan, but when you look at it, your eyes can separate the colors and clearly see how the spaces are arranged without having to analyze very closely the spaces. So I can look back and know exactly um, where the offices are versus where the support is in this drawing. Um, floor plans usually include dimensions and design notations. Um, we added dimensions in the first floor plan, even though we were not drawing the floor plan to scale. And we also included design notations. So design notations can be notes with leader lines, but they can also be the symbols um, to annotate uh, different drawings throughout the space. So if you're looking at a floor plan, but you have an elevation drawing of one of the walls, you might use an elevation symbol on the floor plan pointing to that wall saying, hey, look, if you're interested in this wall, I have a drawing of it, and here's the page and the drawing number. Always still keep in mind line weights. Um, and then floor plans that have multiple stories or multiple floors are typically shown side by side or top to bottom or on different pages. So think about this when you are designing your page composition for your own drawings um, and even your presentation drawings if you were to arrange your floor plans on a board that then you have to take to a presentation. You want people to be able to read it and understand it and interpret your floors. So, you know, having them in order of you know, one, two, three, four um, is easier than having one and four next to each other. That would be confusing. But floor plans can be simple and sketchy, um, like the one on the right here, or they can be more developed and rendered and have more technical details. So the one in the middle has some slight rendering. You can see the important relationship of this floor plan to the site. This floor plan is an elementary school. So you're seeing that main corridor. Um, you're seeing the, the front entrance, which has uh, a revolving door and it goes right through the main corridor and it looks like there's some spaces down the middle, um, but it's going out into the site where there's probably a playground or some recreational um, things happening. And all of the classrooms are aligned um, to the edges with views out to that exterior space. So it is really important, especially with an elementary school, to understand the site while you design the interior and vice versa. 
The next type of elevation drawing, or the ne next type of design drawing that we already mentioned before was the elevation. So an elevation drawing is an orthographic projection drawing that shows one side or view of a designed space. The purpose of an elevation drawing is to show the finished appearance of a given, given side and or view as well as communicate vertical height dimensions. So if you've ever seen the flat plan of a box um, with, and it usually has like dashed arrows indicating where to fold the flaps. Um, and those flaps are happening along the perimeter of the bottom. That is very similar. You can think about that in terms of elevations. So if you were to fold those sides up, each one of those sides is an elevation to the bottom. So consider that bottom as your floor plan and each side of the box is an elevation. So you could have the interior elevation. What, is, what does that side look like from inside? But you could also have an exterior elevation. What does it look from, like from the outside? There could be many. Um, a design doesn't just have the floor to enclose the space. Each, a floor plan could have many, many rooms and those rooms could have many elevations within them. Uh, so choosing elevations that reinforce your design concept and further express any important technical information is really critical. Not everything requires an elevation. So in the, the background image here, we see an elevation for what looks like to be a cafe or a bar, um, but the experience that you would get if you were to walk up to the bar. So you see the height of the actual bar, you see the style and height of the chairs, you see a scale figure so you can place, you see the different types of artwork and how the artwork is being um, hung from different uh, either structural elements or elements that just look structural in nature which might reinforce a more industrial look, for instance. And you're seeing um, contrast in materiality and you also are seeing line weights. Here's some more examples of elevations. Um, so some elevation drawings are more psychological, like in the upper right hand corner, you're seeing textures. I mean, you can see the texture of those walls. Um, you're seeing the way that the bed sheet lays on the bed and the pillows, you're seeing clothes hanging up. It's a space that you can picture yourself in and it's meant to be experiential. But some elevation drawings can be more technical, like in the lower left hand corner, when we're looking at a wall of cabinetry. And really this could be a custom design of a cabinet and you want to really focus on that design. So you're isolating this wall in an elevation and showing the design details or detailed drawing of your design elements, which include where the doors are located, the sizes of the doors, the drawers, if there's a specific trim or hardware element, different types of molding, um, et cetera and how the doors open. So, and typically those are dimensioned with notations pretty extensively. Scale figures are also really important in elevations. You can see the difference between the um, elevations that have scale figures and the ones that do not. So even if there was a scale figure in the technical uh, cabinetry elevation, that would help just that would help a lot, even though there's elevation or there's dimensions. Or if you saw a scale figure, perhaps sitting on the chair in the upper right hand corner, that would also help. So ele elevations can uh, communicate textures and level of opacity. In the upper left hand corners, the two elevations that have the heavy black boundary are really showcasing a custom uh, you know, room design within an office. So, you know, if you were to go into um, a room that is acoustically treated to take a phone call 
or you had a private office and you wanted to have a specific type of partition that has maybe adjustable opacities. Um, and you want to show how those are used or how you intend them to function and look in your design project. So there's two uh, styles of the figures. You can see in the top one that the scale figures are dark and they almost like are the focal point because they're so much darker than the rest of the space. This is saying that they are closer to you. In the bottom one, you're seeing a woman typing at a desk, but she is more gray. So that is indicating that she is further away. And in this instance, she is inside the office. Um, so that the actual wall of the office is closest to us. So you can see how this um, different opacity in this partition is existing. So elevations can be rendered, they can be black and white, they can be sketchy, conceptual, technical, or any combination of these. Even though the one in the middle has some color, that in rendering, it might not be an actual quote unquote, rendering. It is still a conceptual elevation in nature. And then also in the right hand corner, in the bottom right hand corner, you're seeing an elevation of just the fireplace. You don't need to show an elevation of an entire wall. You could just show an elevation of a feature uh, like the fireplace or even that wall of cabinets. So with the fireplace, Elevations are a great opportunity to uh, show zoomed in details of important aspects. So you can see the zoomed in details along the right hand side of the profile of the um, different types of trim elements. The next type of drawing is a section. So a section drawing shows an area or hidden part of an object by cutting away or removing some of that object. Um, this might be small, such as a piece of furniture, or large, such as an entire building. Very similar to a dollhouse, a section just cuts through a certain area, revealing the contents. Um, this cut is called the cutting plane or section cut. So think, think of a building that has all floors being perfectly stacked each floor is at equal height and they have walls in similar places. So a section would show that repetition. So I'm like a hotel probably has the same hotel room for multiple stories stacked on one another. And so that could be useful if you want to show um, how the plumbing is working, how the bathroom on the fifth floor is connected to the bathroom on the first floor and that the pipes can all connect. But pretend you are in a school again and you have an auditorium in the middle of the floor plan. And this auditorium is multiple stories high and the ceiling protrudes like a dome on top of the school with a skylight. So the rest of the school, the roof is flat, except this dome, which comes out of the middle and has a skylight. So a section through the auditorium would show how that works in relation to the classrooms, the offices, and other spaces um, that might have more standardization in the sizes and heights and overall placement in the design. So it, it is interesting to see that auditorium, uh, the volume of it and the size in relationship to the other floors. Um, so a section drawing of the auditorium will communicate scale and proportion of the space, not only structurally, but also psychologically. So somebody could understand what it would feel like to be in the space. Like how high really is it? Let's put a person in there and you can really get a sense for the feeling of that raised ceiling. Um, so sections are also used to further communicate design intention. So let's pretend that this dome and this skylight, the intention was to um, 
take advantage of the natural daylight because there's assemblies during the day. Uh, so that natural daylight could stream in and um, illuminate the stage, provided natural light onto the stage. So you could draw a section diagram that's cutting through that auditorium and you can use arrows indicating that the sun is coming through the skylight, down through the dome, and angled to the stage. Or any other type of design intention you can use through a section to show how it's working or your intention in the space. Here are some examples of sections. So on the left-hand side, you see a wall section that also has what appears to be a kitchen cabinet, um, an upper and a lower. So some sections focus on interior details and interior walls, like this one. And we typically call that um, an interior section or a wall section. So the difference is the wall section would show the, con the guts of the wall. So you're seeing the insulation, you're seeing wood studs, you're seeing structure and different elements. Um, an interior section might just use a thick black line and you know color this completely in black. So we read that as a wall, it's not a functional space. Um, and we're not really focused on what's going on inside the wall because we want to draw the attention to the section of the cabinetry. And sometimes these two um, intentions can be put together in the same drawing like this one. So sections, um, dimensions, notations, line weights, and even scale figures. You can see the difference between the drawings with the scale figures and the ones that don't have them. Even though sections seem to be more technical because they expose the inside of the floors and the walls, and so you're seeing the building elements, um, they are still like highly designerly, and you can maximize them in a designerly way. In the upper right-hand corner and the one next to it, you're seeing building sections, a section cut through the entire building. This you know, would be similar to a dollhouse. And you're seeing how all the rooms work with each other. This is also really important when some of the rooms have different heights of their ceilings or different types of ceilings. Um, so in the right hand corner, you see a spiral staircase that goes um, from the second or from the first floor to the second floor, which looks more of like a loft. Um, and then in the other image, you're seeing the first two floors look fairly standard to each other, but the top floor um, has that you know exposed, raised ceiling, like lofted ceiling. And so elevations are great to show those differences. Um, and you can really start to feel the difference of what it would be like to be um, in you know this middle floor or perhaps on this little loft where the kids are um, on the top floor. This works really well when you're storytelling how your building works or you want to use this to explain how somebody moves through a space. So it would complement a floor plan. And then also sections provide opportunities to connect back to the surrounding site. So on the right hand side um, of the building section, you see some trees and some landscaping. And so this might um, like say like you have a window here and it was really important that um, when you're on this top floor that you can see out to the trees below. So this is showing that you are achieving that. Or in this center bottom section with the pink, you're seeing kind of like a contemporary um, box window, very large. And you can see, A, it's um, somebody can actually go in there. You can stand or sit in there. Um, but also you, 
because there's a scale figure there and there's one shown walking on the outside, now you can see a relationship between the inside and the outside and how important that box window is to the design. In the bottom right hand corner on the grid paper, this is actually a hand drawn section of a dorm. So let's explain this. The top and the bottom, you're seeing the thicker um, lines that are hatched. That's indicating um, the walls and the ceiling. So that's this, you know, interior section way of saying this is architecture, this is structure, but I'm not focusing on the building elements inside those pieces. You're focusing more on the relationship of spaces within the storm room. So it looks like an elevation at first glance, but you might notice that there is a window here. There's a break. There's, um, you see that there is a little bit of the wall right here, um, which is you know a bulkhead. And then there's the wall down here and here's the window. So you're, you're seeing it from the side. So you can picture yourself sitting in this chair and like looking straight out and then starting to understand what's happening on the exterior. And you can even see that there's some kind of overhang here. Perhaps this is a balcony um, that is not accessed here, but somewhere else. And then you're also seeing um, the entrance here and that there is some kind of um, wall divider and um, opening to come into the study space of this dorm room. But look at the amount of detail put into this drawing. So it looks super detailed and you can read it like you know what it is. But when you look, it's really just a series of lines and small little sketches. So it's really easy to use lines and line weights and just gestural strokes to communicate how the space is used, what the space is used for. If there weren't these little lines on this bookshelf, I wouldn't, I might not read it as a bookshelf. I would wonder, is it the inside of a wall? What is this rectangle with lines, um, with horizontal lines in it? You wouldn't know. The next design drawing type is a detail. So detail drawings provide a detailed description of the geometric design form and parts that may not be included in the other design drawings. Um, so they might relate to the other design drawings, but they don't really go into detail. So the detail drawings might be confused with detailed design drawings, which describe the drawings that are produced during the design development phase. But detail drawings include dimensions, notations, symbols, evidence um, of compliance with regulation, um, assembly instructions, and a more intimate drawing of important design elements at an enlarged scale. Um, they are also distinct from working drawings, which provide dimensioned graphical information that can be used by a contractor or builder. Similarly, shop drawings are also a distinct drawing from detailed drawings. So while detailed drawings are distinct drawings, they are expressed through a variety of drawing types that we just went over, depending on the detail needed to communicate. So often detailed drawings indicate typical conditions found throughout the project versus a one-off condition. Um, so an example is the crown molding that's applied throughout an entire home, or perhaps a design um, of a custom door, you're calling out details of that door and that door is used in multiple instances in the design versus say a custom design of a single fireplace and a hearth. Um, that would be a specialty drawing. So it only happens once. And so you see in the images here on the right hand side, you're seeing an elevation of what looks like a built-in bookcase on a wall, but then you're seeing zoomed in version of how that built bookcase is intended to be put together. So these details are not showing the actual construction 
of this bookcase, it's more or less calling out um, the overall design intentions and the materiality. Um, similarly, on the left-hand side, you're seeing a three-dimensional view of a shower. So it's cut in half, it's a section, um, and you can see the tile and the finished surface, but you can also see how it's built on the inside. Um, and so shower drains typically have slopes going down into them. So this detail is calling out the type of drain. In this sectional perspective drawing, the drain would be very small and you wouldn't really see it. So you'd have to zoom it in to really see how it's working. Here are some more examples of details and things to consider when drawing a detail. So they communicate how your drawing works. In the um, image on the right, you're seeing a file cabinet and the drawer is pulled out, but then there's a detail um, zoomed in on the lip of that cabinet. So you're seeing how the connection of the drawer works with the actual case and what it would feel like to pull that drawer out. At the scale of the actual cabinet, it's really small. You can't see the detail of that, so you'd have to zoom it in. And then just above that, you're seeing a detail drawing of a countertop with tile. Uh, and so you're seeing the finished surface, which is the tile and the mortar. And then you're also seeing all of the layers underneath the tile down to the structure of the cabinet and there's notations with leader lines. And each one of those materials is hatched uh, with a standard hatch indicating the materiality. So we le on the um, bottom here, it says wood, but we do read that as um, a wood grain. And then plywood is red uh, like um, it is on this front um, facing, uh, you would, ideally be the cabinet. Um, so material assemblies are communicated through line weight. You can see the various types of line weights um, in the density of the materials and the type of materials in the hatching. But it really helps with if you didn't have any of those written notes and leader lines, you could look at this even without any knowledge of how things are put together and understand what you're looking at. You might not understand it, you know, the way a contractor would, but you would understand what it is because of the use of line weights um, and how things are hatched. Also, custom architectural and furniture details illustrate the design intent for communication with the builder. So reception desks are infamous for being um, something that interior designers do in a commercial project. Um, custom reception desks in retail, in hospitality, um, in offices, very popular. So you would design, you're designing that custom uh, reception desk and um, you would show, use sections, elevations, perspectives, plan. You can use all of those drawing types as a tool to express your design. So in the upper left-hand corner, you see it's titled cross section. You're seeing a section cut through the reception desk, but you're also seeing the profile of the material on the face. And you're seeing how the desk is working from the um, inside. But then below it, you're seeing an elevation of the desk. So what, what it would just look like as you approach it. This drawing or all of these drawings together could be considered specialty if this reception desk was a single one-off and you had enough documentation um, for it to fit on one page. But specialty drawings and detail drawings are very similar for this reason. So um, details can also be in the form of 3D illustrations that are um, rendered with more realistic material indications as well. So specialty drawings, we just talked about those. Specialty drawings are drawings that do not 
fit into the definition of the other drawing types. This does not mean that they're the leftovers. In fact, um, they're usually the standout design element of the project, which makes them special. Um, there's nothing typical about these drawings. Um, so an example would be a custom staircase or a fireplace or a light fixture. Um, that requires various views and drawings and extensive notations to properly communicate the design intention. In these instances, specialty drawings are grouped together in their own page or pages. You do not need to know everything about the fabrication of the design. Um, your drawings are meant to communicate with those trades and specialties who do know how to build a design. So when I think of a specialty drawing, I always remember it by I'm communicating with a specialist or I'm communicating <laughs> with a special field to help me realize this design. So you don't need to know electrical engineering to design a custom luminaire, which is a light, like a light fixture. You could just, if you can draw and design your light fixture with enough detail that a specialist can read it, and translate your design into their own shop drawings, that's perfect. Um, specialty drawings are not to be confused with shop drawings, however. Shop drawings are drawings created by fabricators that include unique building instructions related to the fabrication processes of that manufacturer. So for instance, um, in the example of your custom luminaire, you might not have included the types of screws <laughs> that would be required to assemble all of the components the we'll say it has a lot of like decorative elements to it the shade and <laughs> um but the fabricator the specialist would know that there is a specific type of screw to that needs to be used to make your design work so Again, you don't need to know that type of screw. You don't need to indicate it. You might indicate where you'd like that connection to take place. You know, I want this piece and this piece to connect in this area, like so. And then the fabricator will take that and take it to the next level in a way that they can use those drawings to then build it. So here's some examples of specialty drawings. You're seeing three scenarios. On the left, you're seeing that custom fireplace and hearth, the mantle. In the middle, you're seeing a custom uh, light fixture. And then on the right-hand side, you're actually seeing a hand-drawn sketch from somebody's sketchbook of a custom furniture piece that is built into the architecture. And so here's some things to keep in mind. Again, material assemblies are communicated through line weight. It's because of the line weights that we can read these drawings. Um, and each one of these examples is unique to their project, not um, yours. So when you design your project, your details and specialty drawings um, and even the material assemblies within your sections will be unique to yours. Um, you can't just look up um, a section of an interior wall and see what it consists of and then apply it to your project because that wall was designed specifically for you know a different project and so you can use uh, specialty drawings to think through your design intimately and communicate your intentions in the sketchbook you can see that this designer was using this as a flow of thought as well so they were developing detail specialty drawings, um, but through a journaling method. The next type of design drawing is perspective. Perspective drawing is a technique for depicting three-dimensional volumes and spatial relationships in a two-dimensional way. Um, as if from the viewpoint of the observer, somebody experienced the space. Um, so I think we've all seen a perspective which um, is, you think of these as a rendered image of a project. 
what will it look to walk up to the cafe, for instance, or you see a perspective rendering of um, the student center, like clipped onto the fence of the construction site on the Western campus. So there are two important elements when constructing a perspective drawing, including eye level and vanishing points. And I use the word constructing because perspectives are not to be confused with um, a sketch. Granted, your sketches might be in perspective, but perspective drawings are a little bit more technical, especially when you're learning how to do them um, before you naturally you know, can draw in perspective. Um, so the eye level is the height of the viewer's eye that establishes the position of the horizon. So typically in architectural drawings, this height is five foot six inches. Again, you know, if you're designing for a child or somebody in a wheelchair or a different height or physical um, uh, quality, you can adjust that eye level. But if you're trying to illustrate a perspective from, um, you know, the perspective of like a universal perspective of anybody, a five foot six is generally um, the target. Vanishing points locate the convergent points of lines moving away from the observer. So you can see this in the two examples here of the single point perspective and the two point perspective. A single point perspective, all of the lines are, are going towards a single point. So essentially you could draw your square and then off in the distance you could put a point. And if you were to make your square into a cube, you would use all of the you know more horizontal lines or the lines that indicate the volume of the cube going towards um, and connecting to the single point. So if you connect each one to the single point, they're all going to have a slightly different angle than one another, but there's going to be an accurate angle to what it would actually be if you were looking at it at this perspective. In the two point perspective, you're seeing two vanishing points. Um, so it's essentially, um, you're seeing some, like if you were to look, if you have a fork in the road <laughs> and you're standing right in the middle of the road and you're looking at it and you're on one side, you see a road that goes to the left and on the other, you see a road that goes to the right and you can see the buildings lining the sides of the streets in both directions. So that's sort of the scenario of a two point perspective you can like in this image if you were to think of one and two as the streets um, you put your dot at the end of those streets um, where you know your eyes would naturally see the drawing finish the horizon line essentially you know that it goes past that but your eyes only see so far so though you would put those dots in place and then you would connect um, the three-dimensional aspects of your drawing to those points. Those points don't need to be equal like they are in this drawing. So you could have one really close and two like really far away. Um, it would give you a different effect, but they do not need to be equal. Um, so perspective drawings were once mainly used for presentation purposes. Um, however, with the advanced use of digital methods for creating design drawings and working drawings that allow for the design to be three-dimensional uh, from beginning to end, uh, perspectives can be easily generated and therefore have become an important part of the design drawing package. Um, it is very common for contractors to consult the perspective drawings when estimating costs of a project. So previously, you know, you would think of a package of blueprints um, where each page has a flat drawing, um, the floor plan, the elevation, the sections. Um, but now when we use computers, we can essentially design in three dimensions. And when we do that, as we design, um, it can populate the volume as we go. So essentially, once we've done the floor plan, um, because we're designing in three dimensions, the walls that we have drawn have a height to them. Um, 
and the doors have a specific um, size to them, um, also a height. So you could look at this, you could look at your floor plan in perspective view and see what might look like the box drawing where you see the, the floor plan and then the sides coming up. Um, so you, it's really easy to generate a perspective drawing from thinking through the different types of flat drawings and then drawing them three-dimensionally in the computer. That is a whole class in and of itself. <laughs> right now we're focusing on just a single point perspective and two point perspective. These are the most important perspectives for design. Here are some examples. Um, so perspectives can be freehand, they can be drafted, or they can be computer generated. Really all methods are great. Um, perspectives are a great way to communicate design elements and principles. Um, they can be a good method for concepting and exploring different ideas. So I know sometimes when I um, have an idea for a design, I don't necessarily see my design as a floor plan. I see it as an experience space. Um, and so I would start by illustrating that. What does it look like to be in the space? And I would, you know, arrange the room and um, start populating it with all of the furniture, other elements, and then go from there. So drawing perspectives can help you brainstorm and go and run through ideas. Again, line weight and shading greatly communicate in um, aiding in depth, but also um, add a light source to your perspectives. Um, you don't need to say like light source with an arrow. You can, but you can have a, an implied light source by adding shadows. So in these two drawings on the right, you're seeing subtle shadows in both. In this, it looks like a cafe. You're seeing a really light gray along the base of this counter and this table. Um, and that means that there is light coming from the back to the front. And so it's making those elements have cast a shadow behind them. Um, and then in the bottom drawing, you're seeing the use of a blue pen to really aid in the understanding of depth and different types of planes. Because it could be really hard to um, confuse all of those planes within each other. But you're seeing some shadow underneath this wall mounted vanity, indicating that there might be a light above it, which there typically is above a vanity, and that would cast or even a light, an overhead light, cast a little bit of a shadow of the vanity onto the wall behind it. So perspectives don't need to be rendered. Um, adding enough detail to communicate your design intent is the priority, regardless if you need color or special drawing utensils to do so. All right, the last two <laughs> on our agenda, Axon and ISO. I put these together because they're so similar <laughs> and they, they basically do the exact same thing. So axonometric and isometric um, drawings are two different drawing styles that are often used interchangeably. However, they do have their differences and similarities. So an axonometric, axonometric <laughs> projection is a type of orthographic projection where the three-dimensional object is depicted at a skewed angle so that more than one side of the object can be seen. An isometric projection is an orthographic projection where the same scale is used for each axis. It's the most common used drawing for this reason. So both of those are very confusing, I know. Um, I've created examples here um, on the left-hand side, you see a um, axonometric, which it's like you're almost looking forward into it, but also down, and it's a forced perspective. It's not a realistic perspective. Like you wouldn't see equal sides of something um, at this 
perspective. If you were to see equal sides of something, um, you would see those two sides going to two different vanishing points. But the axonometric, um, in this scenario, the lines are actually parallel to one another and they typically would not meet at a vanishing point. So it's not a realistic view, although it's not an obvious unrealistic view. <laughs> um, and then you have an isometric, which is the drawing to the right. Um, and you're basically seeing uh, your space, your floor plan with the walls brought up and the heights and the details, but it's like you're like a bird and you're, you've cut through the other walls and you can kind of see in at an angle. So it is more realistic. Um, so you can see that it's, we call it a 3060. Um, if you were to see this black line that runs across the bottom, as the x-axis and the corner where both sides meet as the y-axis. You can measure the angles that are created and that will help you determine if it's an axon or an iso or neither. Um, and so an iso is a 30-60 angle. So on one side it's a 30 and on the other it's a 60. An axon is an even 45. Um, so that's a really just quick and easy way to remember the difference. Axon 45, ISO 3060. Coincidentally enough, um, those clear plastic triangles that we were talking about as a drafting tool also come in those angles. So by getting triangles of those angles, and perhaps those triangles come in also different sizes. Uh, you can get different sizes of the same um, degree angles. You can easily construct these drawings manually. So here's some examples. So I've, <laughs> I've created the X and Y axes and then labeled what each one is because it is really confusing. If I were to take away the, the red lines and the arrows and the labels, these all might look the same and they kind of do anyway. Um, so I always think of it as the ISO gives the looking down and into view and the axon is more forward looking than down, even though you're kind of looking down at it. Um, but compared to an ISO, it's more forward looking. Um, Again, axon drawings are considered to be forced perspectives because they're not realistic or they're not, they wouldn't happen naturally. <laughs> um, and typically an exploded axonometric is a popular method for communicating layers of design information. So on the left-hand side, you're seeing a building exploded by it's different um, elements and layers. At the bottom, you see the foundation with columns. And then just above that, you see a finished floor um, with the walls now. So you would think this finished floor could sit like right on top of this thing because it is a puzzle. And then you see a structural frame. Um, and so that would sit into place. And then at the top, you see the roof, which would sit on top. Um, it's sort of like a Russian nesting doll, but for architectural drawings. And these are called exploded axonometrics. And you can also use, you can also do this from the sides of the building as well. This could help if you have a lot of information that you wanna communicate about his space without having extensive amounts of drawings. This very quickly tells us what's going on. And this is in an axonometric view. Um, so we also have other drawings here. So it can be hard to differentiate axon and iso. The difference is 15 degrees. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, 
It's hard. I mean, start looking. And if you were to Google these, you would get some examples. But when you'd measure their angle, most of the examples labeled online axon or ISO are not axon or ISO. Um, sometimes they're accurate and sometimes they're opposite and sometimes they're neither. To be honest, it really doesn't matter. Um, it does matter if you're being asked specifically to do an axon or an ISO, but if you were using this design strategy in your own project to communicate your design, you would just select the angle that makes the most sense to show what you need to show. So in the bottom right hand corner, you're seeing a small apartment and we're seeing it um, like looking down into it, but we don't really see the bathroom. I mean, we can kind of see it ghosted, but if we were looking at it from the other direction, we might see down this hallway and into the bathroom. That might not be an important design element. Maybe it's this angle is the most important. Um, and maybe it's really important to see the bed. So that is the angle. If you can change it, if the design needs to be captured from a different angle. So <laughs> we went through those very fast. Um, we will be using class time um, pretty much through the remainder of the semester to go through these drawings and learn about them very specifically. We're going to apply design to them. We're going to use them as tools. We're going to learn the subtle ways to properly document things through design drawings. I have an example. So I mentioned that um, there is a difference between design drawings and working drawings or design development. So I included some pages from um, a project I did, oh, now it's been a couple years, which was a remodel of a home. Um, here's the cover page of this drawing set. And you can see these very easily generated um, perspective views. Um, these are one point perspectives. So this was a very, uh, it was a remodel of a historic home that only had a single bathroom and the family was growing. So they really needed more than one toilet, more than one shower. <laughs> um, and actually they only had a clawfoot tub with a shower head. And so they really wanted a walk-in shower separate from the bathtub and also spaces functional for children of different ages. So the, the and they, <laughs> it would have to be an addition and a remodel. So I'll take you through it. And the, the project was extremely custom. Um, there was really nothing standard about it. They wanted everything custom and to uh, capture the historic nature of their home. So on this page, you're seeing the demolition plan because this is a remodel and an addition. There are going to be some walls and aspects that need to be taken down. So we documented the existing conditions and identified in red the elements that need to be removed. Then we have um, the shell sections and details. So this is a section of the building, or this is a wall section um, that shows the, you know, from the bottom to all the way to the top and how the roof is working um, with the interior ceiling. Again, everything is dimensioned and notated um, because they wanted everything custom. There were a lot of detailed drawings that came into play. They wanted a special type of skylight, um, special types of, you know, frames around the windows. Um, and so this page just calls out all of those details that pertain to the exterior. A part of the project was a redesign of a staircase 
And so this, uh, <laughs> so they had a staircase that was connected to their original bathroom that went to the attic, which is where their children's play area was, but it wasn't meant to be a functional attic. And the, when you walk up stairs, there's like an angled ceiling above you. Um, that ceiling in their staircase was like four feet tall. So you had to crawl to get up there, which is what they were doing. <laughs> and like, as you walk up, it's a little easier because you just bend forward. But when you go down, you can't necessarily, well, maybe you could bend backwards. Um, they couldn't and neither could we. <laughs> Most people can't. And so you have to go down the stairs in reverse and bend forward. You know, when the kids are smaller, it's not a huge deal. But they were putting their elderly parents up in up in the attic for sleeping when they would visit. And the bathroom was on the floor below. So in the middle of the night, these elderly people would have to crawl down the stairs backwards <laughs> to get in the dark <laughs> to get to the bathroom. So that was something that needed to be fixed. And any time that you have a building that is not to code and you do a renovation, you need to bring the whole building up to code. So we had to bring these stairs up to code anyway, since they were using the attic as a functional space. So this is just the redesign of that element. And then here's the floor plan. They look small here. These pages were actually quite large. Um, so we have the floor plan that shows all of the designed spaces. So I'll explain this here. These are the stairs going up to the second floor. You arrive on the second floor, you take a left and then you take another left and you're in the main bathroom. So this would be the bathroom for their children as well as any guests. Um, then you go back into the hallway. You can go into, this is their primary bedroom. And they wanted a bathroom just for that bedroom for their, you know, private use. And so it was connected right through here and you would go in and this is their private bathroom, which features a walk-in shower, um, but not a tub. The tub was for the children. And so the, the clawfoot tub remained. <laughs> it needed to be refinished because it was in a rough condition, but it remained. And everything, you know, this is their original floor plan here. Um, and then this is actually the design of that attic space. So the stairs that I was just talking about, you actually, so you go into this bedroom and yes, the bedroom is off of the stairs. It's a, yeah. So <laughs> you'll go into this bedroom and then what looks like a closet is actually stairs up to the attic. So these are the stairs that are super dangerous. Yeah, so not only were the grandparents going down the stairs backwards in the dark, crawling, but then they would come out essentially through what looks like a closet door <laughs> into someone else's bedroom. I'm sorry, I'm laughing. It's just kind of funny. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> and so this... Um, right hand image shows the floor plan of the attic space in general so the space that is in the darker line this is the functional occupied space the rest of the space is you know where the roof is so angled that it is either just empty space or it's storage space it has insulation um, that type of thing here's the exterior elevations And here is, here are the drawings for the main bath. Um, so as you can see, we put elevations and details on the same page. In the left-hand corner, there's the floor plan with the annotations for where the drawings are with dimensions. And all of these drawings um, have little labels and titles that 
directly connect them to the floor plan. So you can look at them and know, oh, okay, this is this. Um, so this is an elevation drawing as if you were looking at the tub and then you would also see the shower. This is an elevation of the vanity. So they had you know, cabinetry with custom veneers right here. And then they had a big marble sink. These will all be PDFs on e-learning. So you can go back and look at these if you want. I'm just gonna go through them fairly quickly. This is the exact same thing, but with the master bathroom. And then this is the reflected ceiling plan. So the reflected ceiling plan is not necessarily um, what you would consider a schematic design drawing because it essentially is the floor plan, um, but with the floor plan elements illuminated such as the furniture or materiality and then you just locate the lighting fixtures and the switches the outlets all of that type of information here are the different windows and doors again everything was custom and specialized on this project so these are essentially specialized drawings where these doors only happen in one instance. We said typical closet door, but it um, is the closet door. There's only you know, two closet doors in the same place. So. And here are some casework details. So casework is that custom cabinetry that surrounds the vanities and the closets. So here you can see this is in the main bathroom. Um, or no, this is actually the master, or I shouldn't say master, but the primary um, bathroom. Um, this is the counter right here with a bowl sink that sits on top. And you can see how the plumbing works inside the cabinet. Then you also see there's a bench. Um, over here behind the sink. This one is the main um, sink. This one has a custom marble sink that we had to have fabricated. So we sent we sent this drawing um, with a few other perspectives to a fabricator um, who could then create their own shop drawings off of this. Here is another lighting plan, but with the schedule. So now the different lighting fixtures are, we specified them. And the last page of this project is the roof plan and the structural plan. So part three is coming next. We will be talking about construction documents which include specifications, working drawings, and contracts. So you might have noticed in the drawing I just showed you, I'm classifying that as the schematic drawings. However, we did have some specifications and enough detail where they could essentially be working drawings um, because the pro the the project was so specified that they had light fixtures and different things picked out already. So we, you know, you just applied that to the design and included that. The project was small and it was highly special, specialized and um, we worked with the contractor. So the drawings, uh, and we developed the design with so much detail that by the time the design the schematic design was finished and it was time to now make the construction drawings. We were pretty much there. <laughs> the construction drawings were pretty much done, but these are the schematic drawings. <laughs> and then the other, the third component of a construction document includes the contracts. So that will be next. 
um, next up, but we will be talking about schematic drawings for a while and learning all about the different drawing types because those are drawing types that you will be doing for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, and they will just greatly aid you in uh, communicating any design that you want to. So thank you for your attention and I will see you this week in class.